Welcome to the Gamification Report, Episode 8. I'm David Chandras from the Center for Teaching and Learning here at Humber College. Welcome back. We have a fabulous, fun-filled show for you this week, as we do all weeks. This week, we're going to be looking at serious games and entrepreneurship education. We've looked at that in past broadcasts, but we're going to take a very deep dive today. How do you teach people how to start businesses? Using games. Fascinating area. Collaborative games for training. Collaboration and cooperative. Most of these games suck. Nobody wants to play them. Let's find out how you build ones that really work. Cooperative virtual reality for eating together and managing loneliness at mealtimes. And also the development of virtual and augmented meals. Bella, did ya eat? Let's start off by looking at entrepreneurship and serious games. This is published by Joe Fox, Luke Pitaway, and Aikina Uzabajan in 2018. Little is known and incorporated about actual practice and their veracity in, in, in entrepreneurship and games. However, there's a problem with business games and that they are anecdotal and lacking in rigor. They don't have anything to do with the complexities of the real world in learning. It's a hot field. In 2013, the Kauffman Foundation report showed an increase in entrepreneurship education programs in U.S. colleges. According to the report, by 2006, there were 500 formal programs compared with 250 programs programs in 1985 and 100 programs in 1975. It is hot and on trend. However, they look at all of this idea that um, entrepreneurship education needs to change. It's not working as effectively as it could. There needs to be a better understanding of skills and competencies that it tries to create, more effective methods for evaluating educational pedagogies, and more rigorous studies of educational effectiveness. In short, when you sign up for an entrepreneurship program, there's a guarantee that you'll learn anything that you wouldn't learn by simply starting a business and going a go crowd fund me and making a new pedal for your kick drum. The good. Games place students in interactive virtual environments that are immersive. It's exciting to be part of a business. They have problem solving aspects and they enable reflective learning. All the good, but the not so good is his review of serious games and entrepreneurship. Current games have a tendency to coalesce around small business management and their conceptual framework is all about building a small business. The ugly emerges that these games are not good because they're all about little tiny algorithms of what happens if uh, a customer fails to pay a bill, what happens if you want to score a new contract, etc. They don't have anything to do with the fact that the business may become insolvent and you have to manage that. That there will be a fire that will destroy your entire operation and you have to negotiate with insurers for two years to get back where you were. Their games are weak. They're sloppy. They don't do the job. That's at least what he found in his research. <sighs> They're good for eating cheesy puff and hanging out for a friend on the couch. But beyond that, they don't seem to do much. And it goes down from hill, downhill from here. Gaming is generally poor at simulating other aspects of entrepreneurial learning. Low degrees of fidelity, disruptive effects and learning from mistakes and acting in disruptive ways are not covered in these games. We've seen them for years. Hamburger Empire. It's got to change people. You have to build into the games the possibility to really simulate a game in an effective way. Sometimes don't rely on your software. Build card and board games or a Dungeons and Dragons type games that use a large manual to give you different scenarios that you have to advance and stop with the Burger Empire simulators, please. The big problem here, of course, and why I'm pleading to you, is that fidelity is key and often missing. His studies show that running a disruptive startup company requires nonlinear decision making. You have balance. Most games do not allow for catastrophic failure. Fidelity, fidelity, fidelity. If you're going to build a game for entrepreneurship, then it has to simulate the real world, not simple little decisions about how many people to hire for the, st the busy season in your ski retail operation. I cannot hold back your tie to bad decisions. Collaborative Gaming Guidelines is the next area we're going to look at this week, and this is work by Diego Buschinger and Marcello de Silva Hansel, 2018. This is fascinating because those of us that have been gamers our life know one thing for sure. Cooperative games suck. Malone and Leeper in 1987 talks about the fact that there's different types of cooperation and competition that can exist in game settings. So let's dig a little bit deeper. This goes back to 1987. Exogenous cooperation. There's no link between participant tasks. I'm doing something. You're doing something. We're all playing a game, but it doesn't matter what we do because we're in the game world together, but we're doing our own thing. Endogenous cooperation is where we're linked together. So if you're in a soccer team, each player would have a role to play. Exogenous competition is that one can't 
interfere with each other's performance. I do 100 meter dash, you do 100 meters, that's exogenous. We're competing against each other. And endogenous competition is that no competitor can interfere with, with another's performance, but the actions are connected to the outcome such as a chess game. Cooperative, competitive, serious games are what he looks at. Brizzoni, as early as 2009, present, started to present these kind of human resources training. And this was to help fight terrorism, to improve analytical skills. And people were free to choose different approaches, how they'd cooperate and how to compete. And there were limited time matches and intelligent computational agencies. And what he found is that when he used a game, uh, he used another game called a Sherlock mystery, and that you can see that pre-test and post-test averages changed. This was the average grade that people assumed after playing these games. So these are people playing collaborative games, playing together, and we can see that in all cases the post touch averages were higher. So collaborative games in which each person plays a specific role, but there's a coherency between the roles. You're in an emergency medical simulation. One is the nurse, one is the paramedic, one is the surgeon, one is the hospital administrator. That kind of collaborative training involves cooperation in which you compete either against a another team doing the same job, or you're competing against something like the patient getting worse. And we can see here when we looked at game score, whether we had junior high school, high school, undergraduate or postgraduate, the post edge grades all increased over time. So when we put people into teams where they have to collaborate, i.e. cooperate to achieve an outcome, we can get past this terrible problem of the fact that cooperative games suck. Key factors in collaborative game design have to do with the number of players. Two, three, four, five, you need at least four to have any kind of collaborative game. How much time is there to play? How many do you communicate in the game? How complete can you get in the game? Can you finish it by yourself or do you need everybody with you? What's the infrastructure of the game, the user background, the domain experts assessment? It all ties together to produce games in which if you work together as a team, you get better outcomes rather than lecturing at somebody with a bony little finger saying, play nice. Cooperative virtual reality faces some of the same struggles, but it opens up some really exciting territory. Arnold publishes in 2018 on a game called You Better Eat to Survive. And this is a two-player virtual reality game in which we eat food. They've got little tiny microphones attached to your cheek and you can hear the person eating. And what you're essentially doing is deciding how much need food you need to survive in a game and to ultimately escape from a virtual island. And so it teaches you to eat good food or to eat less. It changes your behavior by using VR and by using these sensors. Now, this is going to get really interesting in a second. Ah, <sighs> mealtime. What a fabulous way to connect with all our dearly loved friends. Yum and yum. In his study, he took, uh, initially took 22 players and that eating real food improved players' feelings of presence and challenged stress dependence. The idea here that virtual reality games might be able to simulate some of the benefits of real foods, and that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to begin to the work of the Greek philosopher Epicurus, who gave us three admonitions. Live in nature. If you want to be happy, live in nature. Number two, work for yourself, never get a job. And three, never eat alone. He was really important, very focused that in order to be happy, we had to have friends around at mealtime. And you know, this is so important for us with seniors today who are living alone. Catherine Gervais in uh, 2012 developed a really fabulous uh, technology to deal with the loneliness of uh, solitary dining. And this project was called Project Nourished. And Project Nourished grew out of this early work. Now what they have in Project Nourished is an aromatic diffuser, a virtual reality headset, a bone conduction transducer, a gyroscopic utensil, virtual cocktail glasses, and 3D printed food. And you can actually eat food in virtual reality without eating. How good is that? It's what's called computational gastronomy. You probably haven't heard of it. Now you've heard about it. We have an area called hypergastronomy, the idea of creating virtual foods for people to eat. Augmented gastronomy, that is producing holographic artifacts over the food. Imagine a table that has nothing on it, but you've got a hologram of a meal in front of you. You've got chewing free gastronomy in which you can inhale the foods and you get a sensory focus in enjoying the food without chewing it. Algorithmic gastronomy in which we do food hacking. You're able to actually produce different foods for your hologram and, and be able to find out what it is about a food that people like. Maybe they like the freshness of a strawberry or the coolness of a cucumber. That can be developed in this model. And finally, robotic gastronomy where robots will make dinner for you, preparing food for seniors. This is such exciting. And this is a hologram of one of their projects which goes 
beautiful bottle of wine and glass of claret being... Now, could you imagine if you have an eating problem, you eat a little too much, your tummy's just a little too big. Or if you're all alone and isolated and you have no one to eat with. These ideas and these advances in holography and VR are going to do fabulous things for us as we move forward in the world. That's it for this week, folks. Bon appetit. May your week be filled with working for no boss, being in nature, and lots of yum yum on the plate. We'll see you next week. David Chandra, Center for Teaching and Learning here at Humber College. Catch you on the flip side.